afternoon. It's Thursday, August 4th. I'm Yumna Nofen. You're watching the English News. These are today's top stories. Speaker Rabih Bede chairs the National Dialogue's third meeting in Ain Tine that was set to tackle the new electoral system. Lebanon's Hezbollah says that the partition of Iraq and Syria is a possible outcome of sectarian fighting across the region. And Daesh fighters inside the group's Iraqi stronghold of Mosul are weakening and showing signs of frustration. This is according to U.S. military officials. Speaker Nabih Bede chaired the National Dialogue's third meeting earlier this morning at Ta'in al -Tini. It was set to tackle a new electoral system. Now, although the session was the last of three successive ones, it was decided that an extra meeting will be held on September the 5th. The session convened in the absence of change and reform bloc leader MP Michel Aoun, progressive socialist party leader MP Wali Jamlad, and Marada chief MP Slaiman Fanjiye. Lebanese Democratic Party leader Talal Arslan after the meeting ended and said, Today we continue the talks on the implementation of the Ta'if Accord. MP Ghazi Al Aridi stated that the dialogue is not a waste of time, it is a major issue, and an alternative is a boycott and a vacuum. For his part, Kata'ib party leader MP Sam Jmayi lashed at the suggestions aiming to create a Senate, saying, Studying the reforms usually happens in the parliament, not in any other place. So Lebanon's Hezbollah is saying that the partition of Iraq and Syria are the possible outcomes of sectarian fighting across the region and there is no prospect of any end to the war until after this year's November U.S. presidential elections. Sheikh Naim Qasim, the deputy leader of the Iran-backed group whose forces are fighting alongside President Bashar al-Assad against rebels supported by Western and regional powers, said Hezbollah, Iran, and Russia would stand by Assad until the end. In an interview with Reuters, he said recapturing Aleppo, Syria's second major city where a decisive battle is unfolding, remained an objective but was not an immediate goal. The U.S. and its allies say that by waging war against his own people, Assad can have no future in Syria, while Russia and Iran, wholly opposed to regime change, maintain he is the legitimate president, albeit of a state shrunk by rebel gains. The United States says that intensive diplomacy is going on to try to agree on a humanitarian pause in the fighting in the Syrian city of Aleppo. It also says that it hopes to see an agreement for a comprehensive humanitarian plan in the next few days. There's still time and we cannot give up hope. Bear with us and I think in the next few days there might be some development. The woes are the words of UN Deputy Special Envoy for Syria, Ramzi Azeldin, speaking in Geneva. Turkey's EU affairs minister says that comments by Australia's chancellor suggesting talks with Turkey on joining the EU should be ended comes disturbingly close to the rhetoric of the far right. Austrian Chancellor Christian Kern said that he would start a discussion among European heads of government to quit talks with Turkey about joining the European Union because of the country's democratic and economic deficit. During a meeting in Ankara with Thorben Jaglan, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Turkey's EU Affairs Minister Omar Selik said Kern's statement was disturbing. European leaders have voiced concern over Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's crackdown on suspected dissidents after a failed coup attempt last month, identifying his idea of reintroducing the death penalty in Turkey as a red line barring accession to the EU. Coming up next, a woman is killed, five people injured in a knife attack in central London. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back. The Obama administration says that $400 million in cash paid to Iran soon after the release of five Americans detained by Tehran was not ransom for them, as some Republicans have charged. The five, including Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian, were released on January 16th in exchange for seven Iranians held in the United States for sanctions violations. The prisoner deal coincided with the lifting of international sanctions against Tehran, but at the time the U.S. said it had settled a long-standing Iranian claim at the claims tribunal in The Hague. It is our contention that there was no ransom paid to secure the release of U.S. citizens in 
uh, who are being unjustly detained in Iran. Uh, because, A, it's against the policy of the U.S. government to pay ransoms. Uh, and that's something that we told the Iranians that we would not do. We would not, we have not, we will not pay a ransom to secure the release of U.S. citizens. That's, that's a fact. That is our policy and is one that we have assiduously followed. Iran uh, was at that time, and frankly still is to some degree, uh, relatively disconnected from uh, the international financial system. And so that raised certain challenges in uh, getting them their money. Uh, it couldn't be done uh, over wire transfers or any of kind of the legal methods that, uh, or the legal, the financial method rather, that are commonly used to transfer uh, large sums of money. Uh, so bearing in mind that, um, you know, we had to figure out ways to get them the money. Um, we don't have, we've never reestablished a direct banking relationship uh, with Iran and still frankly don't intend to do so. Yeah. Daesh fighters inside the group's Iraqi stronghold of Mosul are weakening and showing signs of frustration ahead of a battle to recapture the city, according to a U.S. military official. Iraqi and Kurdish forces, backed by U.S.-led coalition trainers and air power, have for months now been edging toward Mosul, Iraq's second city and home to two million people. The Islamic State group says it controls it since June 2014. But concerned that city residents are communicating with Iraqi security forces, they have started cutting off internet access. Now, the coalition spokesman says that the same thing happened in Fallujah and Ramadi before each of those cities were recaptured and cautioned that the eventual fight for Mosul, which is expected to begin in the coming months, will not be easy. Still making headlines, the lies and flight cancellations persist at Dubai International Airport a day after an Emirates airliner suffered a crash landing that saw all 300 people on board survive while a firefighter was killed. The cause of the crash landing of flight number EK521, a Boeing 77, coming from the southern Indian city of remind, remained unclear. The world's busiest international airport issued a statement saying that it is running under restricted capacity and has since continued to operate with one runway. It said some flights were coming into the city straight second airport, Al Maktoum International Airport at Dubai's World Center. Several Emirates flights as well as others from foreign carriers landing at the hub were canceled today. Fly Dubai says it canceled 20 flights. Emirates says 157 out of the 282 passengers stayed in Dubai following the accident. A woman was killed and five people injured in a knife attack in central London, which police say they are investigating for possible terrorist links. The 19-year-old man who was arrested in Russell Square in the city center was cordoned off after the attack. Police swarmed the area. A 60-year-old woman was treated by paramedics, but at the scene, she was pronounced dead. Two women and three men were also injured, but no details have been released about their condition. Police were called to Russell Square at 10.33 p.m. local time following reports a man armed with a knife was attacking people. Russell Square is a busy tourist area with a string of high-end hotels and is also close to the British Museum and the University of London. We now know more about the victims and I can say that the woman who was murdered was an American national. Those injured were Australian, American, Israeli and British. We have, of course, spoken to the relevant embassies and will do what's necessary to support them. At this time, we believe this was a spontaneous attack and that the victims were selected at random. The suspect is a Norwegian national of Somali origin. I emphasise that so far we have found no evidence of radicalisation that would suggest that the man in our custody is in any way motivated by terrorism. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, the script for the new London play telling the eighth story in the hugely popular Boy Wizard series, has sold more than 680,000 print copies in the UK in three days, according to Publish Litter, according to the Brown Book Group. The book, a script and not a narrative novel, like author J.K. Rowling's previous Potter books, was published at midnight on Sunday, shortly after the play's gala opening. It is set 19 years after Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which was released in 2007 and the final book in the original series. UK book industry magazine and website The Bookseller said if the sales rate continued, the script book would be the second biggest selling single week for one title since records began with Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows as the first. 
bringing back Rowling's enchanted world of witches and wizards, Harry Potter and the Child features the lead character as a father of three and an overworked employee of the Ministry of Magic. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump says he watched a video that showed Iranian officials were receiving money allegedly provided by the U.S. The Obama administration said that $400 million in cash paid to Iran soon after the release of five Americans detained by Tehran was not a ransom, as some Republicans have charged. The five, including Washington Post reporter Jason Rizan, were released on January 16 in exchange for seven Iranians held in the United States. And I'll never forget the scene this morning. And remember this, Iran, I don't think you've heard this anywhere but here, Iran provided all of that footage, the tape, of taking that money off that airplane, right? $400 million in cash. How does the president do that? How do you do that? You, you, we're going to send $400 million in cash. This is in cash, in currency. Now, here's the amazing thing. Over there, where that plane landed, top secret, they don't have a lot of paparazzi. You know, the paparazzi doesn't do so well over there, right? And they have a perfect tape done by, obviously, a government camera. And the tape is of the people taking the money off the plane, right? That means that in order to embarrass us further, Iran sent us the tapes. Right? It's a military tape. It's a tape that was a perfect angle, nice and steady, nobody getting nervous because they're going to be shot because they're shooting a picture of money pouring off a plane. And then you say, where does that money go? Who gets that money? I doubt it's the people of Iran. I doubt it. But you say, who gets the money? Then you also say, who's authorized to give cash? Who's authorized? No, no. Who's authorized to give cash. And you know what? I'll tell you, it's a disgrace. And Iran released that tape, which is of quality like these guys have. Iran released that tape so that we will be embarrassed. This marks the end of a bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our headlines. Speaker Nabih Bidit chairs the National Dialogue's third meeting in Ainatine to set to tackle an electoral system. Hezbollah says that the partition of Iraq and Syria is a possible outcome of sectarian fighting across the region. And Daesh fighters inside Iraqi's stronghold of Mosul are weakening, showing signs of frustration, according to a U.S. military official. Those are your Thursday headlines here on Future Television. I'm Yumna Nofa signing off. Have a good one.